Kobe can start. So good evening. Welcome to the April 2022 version of Varaha Mehira Science Forum monthly lecture. Uh, I'll start with a brief introduction about Varaha Mehira Science Forum and some of our activities. Then I'll introduce the speaker and then we'll turn over the mic to him. So Varaha Mehira Science Forum was started about five years back with a view to taking science and technology to the general public. We have a website, we have YouTube, we have social media presence. We've uh, nearly about to complete the fifth year this year. And so this is a, this is a website and this is a snapshot of some of the uh, you know videos that you have, uh, programs that you have done before. We have a presence on Facebook. Just search for Varaha Mehra Science Forum on each of these. We are on Twitter, we are on Instagram, and obviously on YouTube. All our talks are both live webcast and available as recorded videos on YouTube. Uh, we also have a couple of WhatsApp groups. Anybody who wants to join and discuss uh, lectures on other issues, science and technology, can just copy down these numbers, contact us, uh, message one of us, and then we'll add you to one of the WhatsApp discussion groups. Uh, we started because we had a feeling that while Madras uh, often considered the cultural capital of India, uh, discusses a lot of culture. Uh, we thought science too is part of our culture and we should celebrate it. Uh, that does happen. There is a lot of uh, there are a lot of people who are curious about science, but popular lectures in the city are few and far between. There are professional lectures, there are organized seminars, but they are all technical and generally not targeted to the public. There are very rare programs that are targeted to the public. Usually they happen at professional institutions, at companies, at universities, uh, and so on. And only very few programs are uh, open to the public. So we wanted a this, so we want a forum where we could have host programs for the general public, which they could attend and where they could interact with each other and express interests and people not just of one specific field, but uh, across disciplines could come and talk to each other and communicate and socialize and so on. And so that we have been moderately successful in this. In the last couple of years, since we have gone on Zoom, we've had a wider reach because uh, we are getting we are able to get speakers from outside the city rather than just people who are visiting the city. And today's speaker, even outside the country, we've had three or four speakers speak from the United States, and today's speaker is one such person. So we are delighted we are having uh, you know, such a wider exposure. Um, so these are some of a sample of some of the lectures we have. We are, while we try to focus on a lot of core science, uh, we are as much interested in the story as in the science. So there is a tendency in science to be all just about the facts and take out all the struggle, the humanity, the history out of the element, uh, and also to kind of keep it, uh, you know, take the fun out of it, which is kind of sad. Uh, so we had Professor Arvind Gupta uh, talk about science through toys, one of our most popular lectures. We had Mr. Dr. K.V. Balasubramani, a meteorologist, talk about weather and climate in Sangam poetry. In fact, he just published a book on this topic and he just got a state government award for it. So we congratulate him on this topic. We had Dr. Uttara Dorey Rajan, uh, uh, professor at uh, Digi Vaishnav College, talk about uh, women scientists of India. Topic doesn't get, doesn't get much attention. We had uh, you know something about Indian industry development, which is kind of related to. We had Professor Aparajit Ramnath from Ahmedabad uh, University who talked about uh, the birth of India's aircraft manufacturing industry. And so these are the sample of uh, an eclectic set of topics that we talk about. Uh, in terms of development and high sophisticated technology, we had uh, somebody like uh, Professor Kamakoti talk about uh, chip design, fabrication, etc. And today he's at a seminar, um, I think, headed by the Prime Minister on this particular initiative. We had Vagadesh Ramakrishnan talk about uh, the advances, advances of technology in Madras, which is considered a kind of a traditional city, more so than say Bombay or Delhi or Calcutta. And so besides this, uh, we also conduct uh, certain courses. Besides the lectures, the monthly lectures, which are open to all free to attend, 
uh, we've had certain demands for a certain specific programs. So we conduct summer courses. So a few years back, we started with a couple of uh, programs, one for you know demonstrating science to kids and another is a five day course on astronomy and mathematics. So we've had to repeat that. We did this uh, on online last year. And this year, in, in fact, coming up in the next uh, 10 days, starting May 11th to 15th, we are offering a course for students. This is only for school students. Uh, we've also had done this for adults uh, separately. We just don't want to mix up the two. So we'll start a course for uh, school students on May 11th to 15th. So while this is a general overview course on Indian mathematics and astronomy, we also have very specific topics. Dr. Badri Seshadri, our host, uh, talks about uh, certain specific aspects like Bhavana and Chakravala, which are related to quadratic indeterminate equations. These are mathematical workshops on um, integer algebra, really. Uh, indeterminate equations are something that people rarely uh, encounter. Uh, and Brahmagupta, uh, uh, Bhaskara, and other ancient Indian mathematicians have done some outstanding work on it. And this is the kind of uh, introduction to it. We did one on Kuttaka, which is linear indeterminate equations. And Badri is planning to offer one about Indian geometry. Uh, we'll notify you of that or you know, keep looking at our website, uh, signing up to our WhatsApp, this thing, and we'll, uh, we'll notify you. Um, today's topic is about environments. And we've had a few talks uh, about the challenges of environmental degradation and about addressing those topics and, you know, uh, the contributions of science and technology to how we can deal with that. Uh, last year, we had uh, Mr. Vijay Bhaskar, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar talk about alternative fuels, the way forward and challenges. He is a very active participant in our WhatsApp group also. Uh, we had Dr. Manpreet Sethi talk about uh, uh, nuclear energy and what is the global picture on it, what are the drivers and challenges, uh, and so on. And she spoke from uh, Delhi. We had Dr. Ravi Chalam, an ecologist, talk about uh, conservation of Asiatic lions. Um, we had the talk about uh, the Thar Desert, really the ecology of the Thar Desert and its history by Pranay Lal. Uh, we had a lecture on the Indian monsoon by T.R. Shashwat. And this all segues into today's topic, which kind of marries environment and development. Uh, Professor Varadarajan of Texas a &M University is our speaker today. He'll be speaking on the topic, environmentally sustainable development. Uh, so we are very delighted to have him. He's actually a professor of uh, marketing. He was head of the department also for a few years. Uh, he's a Madras graduate. He's a graduate. He studied at IIC Bangalore, uh, did his bachelor's there, master's at uh, IIT Madras, then did his PhD at uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. And then he worked for a few years in New York. And for the last uh, 30 years, he's been a professor at Texas a &M University. Um, he's actually teaching a course, a uh, PhD course on innovation, environmental related innovation. And that's kind of what I uh, approached him about, but this is the topic he chose to talk about. Um, he, uh, besides, He's, uh, I'll give a brief uh, summary of his, uh, he's, he's the kind of person that Hilaire Belloc said of describing P.G. Wodehouse, you know, his critics are run out of superlatives. Um, he was, uh, he was the editor of the Journal of Marketing, one of the uh, premier journals. Uh, he served as the editor of the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science. He's a recipient of a number of honors. Uh, he is the Mays Business School Lifetime Achievement Award winner for research and scholarship at, uh, at Texas a and He has received the American Marketing Distinguished uh, Educator Award, the Academy of Marketing Science Distinguished Educator Award, the University of Massachusetts Grad School Centennial Award. The, and this year, he just uh, has been nominated as uh, the distinct, one of the candidates to receive the Distinguished Alumnus Award from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, his uh, alma mater. Uh, American Marketing uh, Association Marketing Strategy Special Interest Group Award for Lifetime Contributions. Um, so a number of awards, Best Paper Award and so on. He's one of the most published authors in the field of marketing. Uh, he's currently Ford Chair in Marketing and E-Commerce, the Mace Business School at Texas a University. Uh, that doesn't really give you a sense of it. So perhaps this wall will. This is the photograph of his wall when he visited a few years back. 
one wall doesn't fit all the awards so he has to split it across two walls and this is one of my favorite photographs is you know his picture on the vt's box a box of cereal he is usually decorated with uh, sports stars and athletes and such such people um so a lot of this sounds very academic uh, what is but there is something we can all relate to when he was uh, in his undergrad days uh, the madras i think corporation announced a contest to help them suggest uh, innovative uh, ways to encourage people to recycle and be uh, friendly and he wrote in the suggestion that you know trash cans or garbage you know the waste basket should have this word use me on them so it will encourage people to do that and they took his suggestion and so you see it uh, everywhere all over the place so you have this uh, use me on these waste basket and we thought we'll take his advice and so we decided to use him and invited him to this uh, give this lecture on this particular topic so without further ado i think we'll uh, hand it over to uh, professor radharaj and i have to mention that he is also my uncle or i am his nephew uh, so no nepotism at the play here all those awards and you know qualification should be uh, satisfactory enough he is also our second second speaker who is on the faculty of texas a&m university we had uh, arun srinivasa who spoke at uh, a few years back uh, last uh, two years back so thank you uh, mama and we have the floor thank you gopu thank you for those kind words uh, are you able to see the screen everybody able to see the screen things yes. working out yes well uh from now on it could go uh, uh, uh you know uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, every time uh, somebody asks me to talk about this topic uh, i uh, give it a lot of thought and update my slides and so on and so forth and so let's hope this works this way so uh, i always prefer to start my talks with quotes uh, uh, the first one uh, wisdom requires possessing a type of humility manifested in an awareness of one's own ignorance so uh, there are a whole lot of issues relating to environmental sustainability develop environmentally sustainable development i'm clueless about so uh, uh, that is my level of ignorance and when i make some observations although gopu introduced me with a lot of superlatives uh, uh, you need to look at anything and uh, you know which you receive uh, with skepticism skepticism in all matters is a first toward step towards truth okay so uh, listen to me with an ounce of skepticism or a gallon of skepticism uh, whichever way you see this one but don't be summarily dismissive of things i've got to say now uh the first question some of you may have is a talk by a marketing professor on environmental sustainable development isn't sustainable development an oxymoron a contradiction of terms you are all at the receiving edge of the persuasive and seductive power of the tools of marketing like advertising price price promotion sales immediately we buy things and so on and so forth and so uh uh why you know at some point i might write something about the role of marketing in the renunciation of renunciation uh but you know uh, I, i will have some things to say uh, uh you know in other words yes even a marketing professor can make a few observations about this one some others may have a question a marketing professor at a science forum is marketing a science maybe a question you have well one way of looking at it is you can think along the lines of different branches of science i'm sure very familiar with this uh, like physical sciences physics chemistry life sciences like biology zoology and then behavioral sciences such as economics psychology and sociology and underneath that you can look at marketing science as an applied behavioral science so uh, this is one way this one i'll give you a little more observations on this one uh, science you can find about 100 definitions in various sources uh, 
One I use in my classroom is the uh, from uh, uh, Lastrucci, an objective, logical, and systematic method of analysis of phenomena devised to permit the accumulation of reliable knowledge. The you know the hallmark or the characteristics of science is is it's objective, it is logical, and it is systematic method of analysis of phenomena to accum permit accumulation of reliable knowledge. So all you need to do is what is marketing science is just plug in the word marketing there and say it's an objective, logical, and systematic method of analysis of marketing phenomena for the creation and accumulation of reliable knowledge on marketing phenomenon. So the first definition is everything under the sun. This is some very specific things under the sun. So that's all there is the difference, okay? One way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is when, when you, instead of, when, talk, when there's a discussion of empirical science, uh, talking about saying that empirical science is the enterprise of searching for the truth by comparing hypotheses with evidence. And, uh, you know, there are some quotes, you know, I'm, I'm always captured, fascinated with quotes, which get across the message much more effectively than I can do it myself. So this is a very fascinating quote uh, uh, on searching for truth by comparing hypotheses with evidence. Uh, the author says, uh, science is intrinsically humble. Any scientific hypothesis must be tested repeatedly by many different people before it is believed. If the hypothesis does not meet the standards, then it is not considered to be a scientific truth. These high standards make it easy to have faith in scientifically proven facts, though the best scientists will admit there is a little margin for error, however small. So what is true of science is also true of marketing science or any other spelling field of this one. This is another quote I like about uh, the characteristics of universities in general or research universities saying that this is too forces attention, liberality of intellectual life and conservatism of methodological demands, saying that the university ought to be viewed in terms of fundamental interdependence between the liberality of its intellectual life and the conservatism of its methodological demands. Uh, we permit almost any idea to be put forward but only because we demand arguments and evidence to back up the ideas we debate and because we set the poor true bar of proof at, at such a high level. Talking about the tolerance for unsettling ideas and insistence on rigorous skepticism about all ideas. So this is another way of looking at uh, this one. So one of my areas of research during the past couple of decades has been issues at the nexus of environmental sustainability and marketing. Incidentally, a correction, uh, Goku mentioned I teach a doctoral course on this topic. No, I teach a master's course on product innovation. And as part of that, I discuss about environmental sustainability and marketing and environmental sustainability innovation. And I also do it at an undergraduate level, but you know, I stopped teaching at the doctoral level in 2018 uh, after about 40 years. So the way I would characterize what I do is nibbling at the edges of an inherently complex problem that has befuddled some of the best and brightest minds worldwide. Uh, why do I qualify this uh, is uh, one of my favorite authors is uh, Richard Dawkins. And one of his books is uh, A Brief Candle in the Dark, My Life in Science. And so most of the work we do is like walking in a huge mansion, which is dark with just a candle or a flickering candle. And with that, we are able to just see things which are in our immediate surroundings and not farther away. So my sustainability journey also I would characterize as an exploration with a candle in the dark, or uh, as a Tamil proverb, the kaiman uh, the reason I pointed, uh, put it this one as uh, an exploration with the candle in the dark is, uh, you know, I look at various, you know, sustainability related issues is a focus of research and teaching in a number of academic disciplines. And so I just stopped at 20 
and started looking, you know, I know all of these areas in which there is some work being done on issues relating to sustainability, like in agriculture, sustainability, agriculture is a big issue. In chemistry, green chemistry, in computer science, data science, et cetera, there is a movement called uh, a 4 g movement, artificial intelligence for the greater good movement. Uh, economics, there is a specialization called environmental economics. In ethics, environmental ethics. In health sciences, health consequences of environmental racism. Innovations, sustainable innovations. In life sciences, they look a lot into biomimicry, saying that birds and animals are very efficient in use of energy and how can we learn from them? And so this whole thing. And so here I am here. And, and, and so that is uh, the cautionary note on uh, this one. So nibbling at the edges, uh, this is something I've done, uh, uh, you know, uh, like working on uh, sustainability related issues. Uh, I'll skip that. Uh, just saying that uh, although uh, the journey has been very satisfying to me, I don't know how much of an impact the journey has had on uh, making a difference to the rest of the world. So let me start with a, a, the, the definition. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. I've seen this, uh, might have seen it earlier. Environmentally sustainable development is essentially meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this was by a former prime minister of Norway and uh, this is part of the World Commission de adopted definition on environment and development titled Our Common Future. Okay. Now, uh, what started with just sustain environmentally sustainable development in the last 25 years or so, if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it has become much more ambitious, not just environmental sustainable development, but environmental, economic, and social sustainability goals, and potting, talking about these are things and the aspirational goals of the United Nations for 2030, like ending poverty in all its forms everywhere, ending, ending hunger, achieving food security, and improve promote nutrition and promoting sustainable agriculture. You can go on to this list. I, you know, I'm going to just skip and pointing out. Uh, uh, promote inclusive and uh, sustainable economic growth, uh, build resilient uh, infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization, and, and so on and so forth. This is a, a list, uh, and uh, these there are 17 goals, and within that, the United Nations listed out. So this is why I say some of the best and brilliant minds working from all over the world working, it's sometimes very uh, intimidating working in the area of sustainability because of, uh, you know, when you look at a report coming out from the intergovernment panel on climate change and so on. Uh, and, and so, so this is the same thing uh, again, this one. Uh, the, uh, you know, sustainability is one of those topics which on which there is discussion and conversation in the newspapers, in the mass media, on and every whether you're watching television or whether you're reading a newspaper or a magazine, you cannot escape hearing or seeing something about sustainability. And, and so sometimes, you know, for my classes, etc., to get across the message, I tend to use these kind of slides, and I'm going to use some of them, recycle some of those slides in this talk as well. And so this is a, a child worker drinking water out of a recycling factory in uh, uh, factory in Bangladesh. Uh, very painful, I'm sure, to watch this kind of a, a picture. But uh, there, is, there is a message to that. And this is where the United Nations, you know, why is a child, instead of being in school, uh, working in a recycling plant, uh, plant, plastic recycling plant, and why did we end up with this kind of uh, this one? And so this is a National Geographic uh, cover page uh, from June 20, this one. Uh, we need to make a choice between planet and plastic, planet or plastic. Uh, uh, right now, uh, worldwide, well, less than 10% of the plastic that is produced annually is recycled. And saying that 18 billion pounds of plastic end up in ocean each year. And if that ends up in an ocean, and that goes into the fish. And when some people eat, have fish, it comes back into our human system. 
and it talks about it. That's this one. So, uh, you know, and here is a boat in the middle of a once upon a time lake, uh, pointing out uh, uh, 2021 was Earth's sixth hottest year on record, temperature report says. And I'm sure after 2022 is over, we will see another title like 2022 was Earth's hottest record, year on record, temperature report says. And if what is happening in India right this month is any evidence, that is a very high probability that we'll see it this way. Now, for a long time, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about political refugees, economic refugees, and violence fleeing refugees. And now increasingly, there is a discussion about climate change refugees as well. Uh, there are some dire predictions that as much as 20% of Bangladesh could go underwater by in another 100 years. And if that happens, uh, uh, you start thinking in terms of climate change refugees, and with all the tension right now in is Assam on various parts of the country, uh, you know, this could be pretty scary. Uh, and, and, and so that, uh, it, it, all of this is just to give you a flavor for uh, uh, this one. Uh, again, uh, increasingly, everyone talks about electric car batteries, you know, electric cars as a substitute for internal combustion vehicles is the way to go. Uh, but uh, then there is another problem there in the sense uh, one of the, this is, there is extensive amount of child labor in cobalt mining in Congo and a couple of other countries as well. And then, and, and so uh, again, uh, uh, you know, you try to solve one problem and then you see something else like uh, uh, abuse of child labor and, and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, at the cost of some you know, sweeping generalizations, I'm going to run through some slides to see why this has uh, risen to, uh, you know, there is such an awakening about the problem. And, and so uh, obviously uh, global warming, climate change, rising sea levels, sea levels et cetera, uh, talking about, you know, this is what's happening, burning of oil fuse, fossil fuels, such as in coal powered bioplants, vehicle emissions, et cetera, resulting in greenhouse emissions, and then global, uh, this one, this photograph, this one, China consumed more than half of the world's coal in 2019, according to the International Energy Agency. And then you see greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, melting of glaciers. And then you see, greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, melting of glaciers, rising sea levels. And, uh, uh, you know, in the US alone, talking about a $1 trillion coastal housing market could face a future financial crisis uh, uh, if this is what is going to happen to coastal housing. And there are people who look at all of this and talk about uh, books, uh, write books and say that uh, it is inevitable, water will come and Miami, parts of Miami will be in underwater, and so on and so forth. Greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, melting glaciers, rising sea levels. And now there is a wake up, and so slowly uh, the world is moving. Okay, this is a problem, global warming, melting of glaciers, rising sea levels. So let us focus on renewable energy, hydro, solar, and wind. And, uh, you know, in every country like India and sent out renewable energy, uh, uh, you know, are kind of a trying to make a transformation toward uh, a clean energy. Now, every one of these at the same time tends to be a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, problem. You try to solve one thing and it relates, uh, creates, it points uh, this one, the trade-offs that are involved and the tensions that are involved become very apparent. And so instead of the word dilemma, in reference to energy, there is a phrase used, world's energy trilemma, achieving energy security, energy equity, and energy sustainability. The point is energy security means, you know, any country for its economic development, uh, economic energy security is an imperative and uh, a crucial. The world comes to a standstill. This lecture will immediately come to an end if there is a power background, et cetera. So, uh, uh, you know, energy security. 
And at the same time, there is also an issue increasingly talked about called energy equity, pointing out, you know, there is more than a billion people all over the world who don't have access to electricity. And there is very a lot of studies which point out a very strong correlation between uh, uh, energy access and literacy, uh, energy access and average wages earned, and the quality of life, and so on and so forth. And, and so everybody in the world should have it as a universal right and talking about this one. And saying that energy security, uh, enough of energy to meet all of the world's needs and energy equity, universal access to energy to every human being should be achieved and it should also be environmentally sustainable. Uh, and that means you cannot have uh, thermal coal power fire plants, etc. Uh, honestly, if you look at these kind of tensions that are there, we all understand that the world may be several decades away from meeting its ever-growing energy research solely from renewable resources. So, uh, you know, uh, just to summarize, and, uh, you know, I'm still in the introduction stage. I need to keep an eye on uh, how much time I have, and, and I have another 45 minutes, it looks like. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm in good shape, I guess. Uh, uh, so, we, you know, when I were talking about the climate crisis, all of these streams and many more come into play, like greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, global warming, rising sea levels, uh, biodiversity loss, and increasingly about shortened lifespans and premature deaths due to this one. Uh, this one. So uh, it's such a timely topic, uh, uh, as many of you may be aware on uh, just a week ago, last Friday, uh, that is uh, April 22nd, 2022, was the uh, World Earth Day. And there was this uh, report from United Intergo Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change saying that the world is running out of options to hit climate goals with the world on track to blaze past its climate goals, only immediate sweeping societal transformation can stave off catastrophic warming. And, and then, uh, you know, this, from, this is from United Nations, then every magazine has something about it. And so in uh, the editor of New Yorker uh, uh, pointed out, reports of our inadequate response to climate emergency roll in as regularly as tides. Uh, I'm going to build on this. Our inadequate response to the climate emergency role in as regularly as tides. It is hard to envision a louder alarm, and yet we seem to be able to sleep through it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody is aware of the crisis, but yet we are uh, this one. So uh, that when I was, you know, this uh, reminded me of... Uh, uh, my grandnephew, uh, Surya Sri, uh, recently published a book called On the Brink of Extinction. This was not on issues relating to environmental sustainability imperative, but I thought it is a very eminent and appropriate title for the challenges the world is, society is faced with. Okay, now, then the next question comes as to uh, why is there an inadequate response to climate emergency even as, you know, as this one, and why is there, when there is such a loud alarm, yet we seem to be able to see through it? And so if you're looking for explanations, one way of looking at it is, uh, I'll use this title again and again, uh, Homo sapiens, supposedly wise humans, why, you know, collectively, we are nonchalant about the climate crisis. And one is, first thing you need to keep in mind is, about 5 billion people inhabiting planet Earth, their only emissions are subsistence emissions, you know, going to work, coming back from work, and having a dimly lit electric bulb in their room, uh, giving a little bit of illumination during the night, and a gas stove or whatever it is. It is only the rest of the population, another two point, which is in addition to subsistence, there's also discretionary and a lot of luxury emissions. That is one thing to keep in mind. The other is why this is happening. There are multiple explanations. I'll go through a few explanations. One is essentially saying that this is what happens. Persuading consumers to engage in responsible actions poses a challenge. 
since the beneficiary may not always be the consumers who engage in pro-environmental behaviors, but others and society at large or the planet Earth. In other words, what is in it for me? Why should I engage in a particular behavior if I'm not going to benefit, but and so this one. Another way this is same thing is answered is on the one hand, the benefits we derive from the products we buy and use or consume are in the near term. It is immediate for a consumer non-durable and it is during the lifespan of durables. However, the environmental costs are less apparent and far into the future, you know, something that is going to happen. It is difficult for humans to relate to threats which are far in the future. So there is the, the whole field of bio, you know, if you go into the field of bio, evolutionary biology, they put it in a very nitrous saying that research in social psychology such as that our brains are not well adapted to protect ourselves from gradually encroaching arms. Uh, it is like putting a frog in a beaker and gradually increasing the temperature and so on. You know, uh, you have heard this phrase. Uh, we evolved to be wary of saber-toothed tigers and blizzards, but not of climate change, saying that it is essentially, the point is the way humans are hardwired, we are not designed to think about threats which are far into the future, but only things which are immediate and uh, this one. If, uh, in other words, if the phrase often used called like fight or flee, saying that if you see an immediate danger, you run away or this way. And the same thing again, uh, as recently as last week, I came across an article. It's a very fascinating article. If some of you have a time or interest, you should uh, I very much encourage you to this one. Uh, this is uh, by an eminent uh, scientist. Uh, his name is uh, uh, Vaclav Smil. And again, he gives evolutionary exp biology explanation saying that people will eat pork bellies and drink a liter of alcohol every day because the joy of eating pork belly and drinking surpasses the possible bad pay of 30 years down the road. 30 years down the road, you might have an attack, heart attack that is so far away but the pleasure of eating and drinking is immediate. And that is the way the human being is this one. The other is if we all engage in sustainable behavior, the first beneficiaries will be people living in the 2070s. So asking people now to make sacrifices while the first benefits will accrue to their children and the real benefits will accrue to the grandchildren, doesn't resonate with the average human being and saying that none of us is wired to think that way. So this is the essence of the evolutionary biology explanation uh, over, uh, uh, you know, from our hunter-gatherer days over for 50,000 year period, this is how humans have been wired to think and act, and that is a problem. There is also a tragedy of commons explanation, which is very interesting. Uh, it goes back to 1968 saying that as individuals, we use shared resources uh, in a rational but selfish manner. But in doing so, we cause long-term disastrous consequences for everyone by destroying the shared resources. So if you just Google or try the word tragedy of commons, you will get a lot of illustrations. And so I pulled one and to explain the concept of the tragedy of commons, uh, a commons is, uh, you know, uh, the British thing, which is used to refer to a shared resource. So if, if there is a field in which you can bring your sheep to graze, uh, and this place doesn't belong to anyone, this is what is called as a shared resource or a common. And so here they show there are three shepherds, each with one sheep. And use of commons is below the carrying capacity of the land, all users benefit. Then what happens is if one or more users increase the use of the commons beyond its carrying capacity, the commons becomes degraded. The cost of the degradation is incurred by all users. And finally, in other words, each one acting selfishly let me bring two instead of one sheep uh, so that I'll be more prosperous is this one. 
and and then everybody acting like this is uh, results in eventually the land will be unable to support the activity and so that is the essence of what is called as the tragedy of the commons uh, 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 is saying that uh, each individual acting you know in other words uh, not using mass transportation but driving uh, to work or say in this one well you know uh, that is individuals acting in a rational but selfish manner you reach your destination fast it's comfortable and so on but this one so in all of this context so the, how do we deal with all of these problems? And so sustainable development, there are some very basic principles. Uh, you may say this look like common sense and for them to come out of United Nations, uh, 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 you know, well, there is this one. So over a period of time, uh, sustain, you know, United Nations has tried to emphasize these as the uh, sustainable development principles. Uh, one is called as the replenishment capacity principle or the regeneration capacity principle, uh, assimilation capacity principle, and precautionary uh, principle. What do these terms mean? Saying that uh, regeneration capacity principle, saying the rates of use of various renewable resources should not exceed the capacity of the earth to replenish them. And uh, so, it, it, you know, uh, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Swaminathan, uh, who has written extensively on this topic, uh, on the replenishment principle concept, saying that uh, in uh, India and in many other parts of the world, talking about the unsustainable rate of depletion of groundwater in India and many other countries, saying that point is, if uh, the rate at which we use water is the same rate at which groundwater is replenished by rainfall, then we will be in the rate of use of renewable resource being not exceeding the capacity. But what is happening is groundwater depletion happening at a rate, once if you could hit groundwater at the level of 10 feet, now borewells have to be drilled to 100 feet, 150 feet in order to reach this one and saying that this is the essence of and this one. And I'm sure many of us have seen some solutions of partial solutions, uh, such as rainwater harvesting, et cetera. And this is how uh, this relates to the uh, replenishment capacity principle. Then the assimilation capacity principle saying that, well, you know, any of us who have, so, you know, be, we have straight waiting, been on a road waiting for a bus or a train or something like that with vehicle emissions, et cetera, uh, rates of emission of various wastes should not exceed the natural assimilative capacity of the ecosystems into which they are emitted. Uh, like for example, greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere and toxic waste pollution of oceans, rivers, etc. In other words, up to 350 parts per million of carbon emissions, uh, the atmosphere can handle it. But now we are at something like 460 or something like that, saying that the rate of emission of various wastes far exceeds the natural assimilative capacity of the ecosystems into which they are emitted. And how all of this translates, uh, uh, you know, our one pre piece of research in 2015, talking about air pollution resulting in about 6.5 million deaths annually, water pollution resulting about 1.5 million deaths annually, and pollution in the workplace resulting in about 800, this one. Interestingly, some people are doing some work research saying that instead of talking to people and talking about do things to save the environment, whether the framing of the message of do these, these, this, or else your lifespan will be shortened, whether that kind of a message framing will be more effective. And you can see all kinds of things talking about here, the you know, pollution related killers such as mercury, arsenic, and so on and so forth. And uh, this, this is the essence of uh, uh, why the assimilation capacity principle matters, meaning make, making sure that the emission of various ways not exceeding the natural assimilative capacity of the ecosystems into which this one, uh, uh, this is what is uh, one consequence we are looking at is premature deaths. Uh, and uh, it talks about uh, the largest number of deaths attributed to pollution occurred in India and China with an estimated 2.5 million and 1.8 million deaths respectively. 
Other severely affected countries include Pakistan and Bangladesh, and so on this kind of a research. Then the third principle is precautionary principle, talks about countries should extensively employ a precautionary principle to approach and protect the environment, and lack of full scientific uncertainty should not be a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation, where the threats of serious this one, in other words, uh, there are vested interests like the energy industry trying to say the question, the scientific certainty, scientific certainty, and saying that, you know, when the threat could be serious or irreversible, precaution makes sense. And I guess our elders have told it as long time ago as Varumun Kapadun Alam. So that is the essence of precautionary principle. So the next question comes why is environmental sustainable development an imperative now? But this was not something an issue about 100 years ago. A uh, simple way of looking at it is there is this equation which you know talks about what is called as the IPAT identity, talking about the impact of the population, uh, saying that uh, I stands for impact of human activities on the degradation of the planet and the natural environment. Uh, at a high level of simplicity, you can say it is a function of population, it's a function of affluence, and it is a function of technology. These two definitely directly have a positive impact in, in more of a causing a degradation. Technology works both ways. It is the savior as well as the source of the problem. Uh, saying, you know, for why population? By 2050, the world's population is projected to be in the range of 9.5 billion to 10.5 billion. And as I said, even there is subsistence emissions even for every human being. Affluence. An increasingly larger percentage of the population is becoming increasingly affluent and emerging as a market for a growing array of goods and services. Uh, that is good. The world is becoming a better and more equitable place for humanity. And so often we can think of is the quality of life everyone, most of us enjoy, those of us at least attending in this session, our quality of life is far superior to what Queen Victoria might have enjoyed, uh, the royalty might have enjoyed, about uh, 100 years ago or 200 years with all the worldly comforts we have, like air conditioning, a personally owned automobile, telephone, uh, a smartphone, and so on and so forth. So technology is works both ways. On one hand, technology resulting in innovation. If you start thinking in terms of the number of products owned by individuals and households today, versus 25 years ago, versus 50 years ago, versus 70 years ago, 100 years ago, et cetera. So you find that this is where, uh, you know, the impact on the great degradation of the planet and the natural environment is due to technology and the innovation and the quality of life and the, you know, our worldly possessions and so on. At the same time, this is what we are now looking for solutions for slowing the degradation of the natural environment caused by population and affluence in this one. So uh, uh, this has uh, been a long introduction and let me try to quickly run through uh, a few things to this one. So one way of looking at it and saying that sustainable development uh, from principles and imperatives to roadmap, what are some solutions and what needs to be achieved? And this is pretty straightforward. One is significant reduction in carbon emissions, methane emissions, sulfur dioxide emissions, and whatever are the other almond emissions, which could, uh, you know, cause global warming. Uh, on the other side, there has not to be, got to be a significant reduction in energy consumption and water consumption. If you start thinking in terms of the replenishment capacity principle, you know, uh, you, you cannot, uh, this is what this world does. Significant reduction in waste during manufacturing. Significant reduction in amount of renewable materials used for producing goods, performing services, and packaging of goods. Significant reduction in amount of various materials used for producing goods, performing services, packaging materials. There is also going to be a significant increase in substitution of energy generated using non-renewable resources such as coal with energy generated with renewable resources such as hydro, solar, and wind. Uh, there has got to be a significant increase in substitution of non-renewable materials with renewable materials. 
uh, substitution of more abundant non-renewable materials without this one. So if you say this is what are some things which need to be achieved, and then they ask the question, how does it achieve it? And one major pathway is innovation. And innovations in the genre of low franking fruits to moonshot innovations. So you know, quickly, very briefly, what I mean by innovation, you know, you could have a number of different definitions. Uh, simplistically, you can think of it as a solution to a problem, a better solution to a problem. And you can see that these are all problems. We need to reduce carbon emissions, methane emissions, sulfur dioxide emissions. We need to reduce energy consumption, water consumption, reduce waste, and so on and so forth. So in the context of every one of these things, a sustainable innovation is a solution to a problem. How do we do that? And sometimes it is a better solution to a problem, a novel solution to a problem. And these are some more traditional definitions. These uh, like successful commercialization of an innovation, many of us can relate to light bulb, but you know, uh, this is a proof of a concept in the Edison lab. And, and then the whole world using a light bulb is commercialization of an in invention. And sometimes it's a commercialization of a discovery. Penicillin, there's a lot of interesting things about uh, during second world war, how much there was an emphasis to produce penicillin in massive amounts to treat soldiers who were wounded on the battlefields and so on and so forth. And you can go on like successful conversion, implementation, transformation, translation of an idea into a product. And uh, what is a product of value meets an unarticulated need in this one. So uh, quickly, uh, you know, sometimes I look for examples to get across uh, saying that innovation is a solution to a problem. And so some of you might have read this in uh, newspapers. I think I got it out of uh, the Hindu. Uh, like uh, there is this girl, Venisha Uma Shankar, uh, who submitted this as an entry uh, for uh, iron max powered by the sun. And so this is substitution of carbon emitting, non-renewable fossil fuel with clean renewable energy. So this is the essence of what we sometimes refer to as sustainable innovations uh, uh, and, and uh, this one. Uh, uh, so one other thing is uh, quickly before we go to this one, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. I often use it in conversations, etc. Uh, in reference to the importance of definitions, uh, 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 very fascinating uh, quote which uh, invokes Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Voltaire to stress the importance of definitions. Uh, 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 you know, it goes on. There was a hint of this new science. I'll let you read it. You know, uh, in Socrates' maddening insistence on definitions and in Plato's constant refining of every concept. Aristotle's little treatise on definition shows how his logic found nourishment at the source. And if you wish to converse with me, said Voltaire, define your terms. How many a debate would have been deflated into a paragraph if the disputants had dared to define their terms? This is the alpha and omega of logic, the heart and soul of it, that every important term in a serious discourse shall be subjected to strictest scrutiny and definition. It is difficult and ruthlessly test the mind, but once done, it's half of any task. The reason I put it is, uh, you know, uh, in reference to, I, I agonize quite a bit about how a construct should be defined. And this may be the 50th or the 60th iteration playing with words and to this one. And so in uh, classroom and in my articles, this is how I defend sustainable innovation. It is the creation of economic and environmental value through the implementation of an idea for a new product process or practice or modification of an existing product process or practice that reduces the harm caused to the environment by a firm's activities by identifying, mobilizing, and deploying necessary resources. Now, this is more of what, you know, uh, nobody is going to remember this. This is much more of an operational definition. You need a simple definition, like it's a solution to a problem or a better solution to a problem. But also at the same time, you need this kind of rich definitions which provide a more detailed roadmap of saying that, okay, what you're trying to do is, uh, you know, 
it is implementation of an idea and this one. So if you, another way of looking at it is, if you look at what distinguishes a sustainable innovation is a defining characteristic of any sustainable innovation is it reduces harm caused to the natural environment compared to substitute products. So uh, what I did about 10, 15 years ago is as I compiled about, uh, uh, about uh, 100, 200, uh, 300, I don't know, a very large number of examples of sustainable innovations and tried to this one. And what is the common denominator? If I were to put them into some groups, where do they fall? And one thing which was very apparent to me is if you look at sustainable innovations which are low-hanging fruits, meaning any firm can do it, very broadly, they fall into three categories. Resource use reduction innovations. It is essentially a reduction in the amount of use of resource used in a product or process. Resource use elimination innovations. Elimination of resource used in a product or process. Can we meet this need without using this ingredient. Resource use substitution innovation, a substitution of a resource used in a product or process with another resource, et cetera. So I found almost 90 to 95% of the innovations essentially which happen in companies at the low end fall into these three categories. So, and the next thing that happens is these three things, resource use, reduction, elimination, and substitution, happen and these three five stages of uh, which is of any product life cycle product it all starts with raw materials extraction it then moves on to production distribution use consumption and post use consumption disposal and what are some potential ways of achieving resource use reduction elimination or substitution in these five stages is what happens for example if you think in terms of a more fuel efficient car what happens if it gives 100, uh, it, it travels 100 kilometers for a liter? Basically, the innovation is uh, uh, achieving greater efficiency in the used stage of the life cycle of a product and so on and so forth. Interestingly, in pre 2000, if you look at it, product defines focus was ease of assembly, you know, how to lower the manufacturing costs and great emphasis on mass production, lowering manufacturing costs by ease of assembly. And post 2000, there has been a, re a rethinking and the product design focus is now both ease of assembly and ease of disassembly. If something is easy to disassemble at, at the end of its life, you know, whether it is a car or a refrigerator or a washer or a dryer, a larger percentage of product can be recovered and reused, repurposed, recycled, et cetera, following post-use disassembly. So there is a great emphasis these days on this, uh, these days in manufacturing on ease of disassembly as well. Okay, so uh, uh, I need to keep tab on my time as well. Uh, uh, so uh, I, uh, do I have another 15 minutes? Your honor. Uh, yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, another 15 to 20 minutes, I'll try to wrap up and uh, this one. So, the, you know, some of these things which I'm also going to talk about is, uh, uh, I, I would say these are uh, things uh, which uh, I use in the classroom. Uh, uh, you know, it's difficult to, uh, this one. So, there is so much essentially you can say that uh, even before the dawn of awareness about sustainability, manufacturing always there was a focus on use resource use reduction. How can we do something more efficiently by using less of a resource? The only difference is this resource use reduction is gone onto high gear in the aftermath of the greater importance of sustainability. Reduction in the amount of use of renewable resource, reduction in the amount of this one. So let me, you know, I, like for example, if you look at it this way, uh, the uh, can in which the soft drink comes, uh, uh, over an 80-year period or a 60-year period, its weight has brought, been brought down from 80 grams to 13 grams. And uh, uh, so that is the essence of uh, uh, resource use reduction. The next thing is about 73% of the aluminum cans that are used in the carbonated soft drink industry now come from recycled aluminum. 
So this is the essence of reduction in weight of the aluminum, weight of empty aluminum soda can, increase in percentage of cycled, recycled aluminum, etc. And all of this makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, the total number of units of uh, cans, these kind of cans that are produced annually is half a trillion. That is 500 billion cans are used every year. And, and so uh, that is uh, the way things, uh, this work. Uh, you know, I continuously keep looking for examples of, uh, you know, what I did in 2017, and I look for more contemporary examples. And so this is what Colgate is doing, introducing a new toothbrush, and essentially, instead of throwing away the entire brush, it has split it into two, and saying that in future, this will be a permanent part of what you have. Uh, you'll be buying only this one in packs of six or so and just flipping them on the top. Uh, you know, everything makes a difference. So, uh, uh, you know, it has an aluminum handle with a replaceable plastic pressure. So all I'm trying to point out is this is how innovation happens in companies in response to the environmental sustainability imperative. So uh, the same thing also happens in the issue of resource use Elimination. Uh, there's a lot of work, or you know, if you look at innovations, uh, uh, next time you see something which is so, this one, uh, elimination of an ecologically harmful ingredient from a product, a phosphorus-free detergent. Uh, about 20 years ago, most of the detergents had phosphorus. But that phosphorus went into lakes, rivers, and other water formations, got into the fish, and then got back into the human being, et cetera. And so, uh, about, you know, all of the detergents are now phosphorus-free detergents. And so that is elimination of an ecologically harmful ingredient. Elimination of a filler ingredient from a product. Uh, um, about 20 years, 10 years ago, most liquid detergents came in the US at least in one gallon containers, liquid detergents. And now all of them have been transformed into 32 ounce concentrated liquid detergents by cutting out most of the water, which is essentially a filler ingredient. And sometimes it is the elimination of the need for the use of a complementary product. Now think in terms of what is your iPod, is a product in which your, uh, uh, before that, if you think in terms of a cassette player, you had the cassette player and the cassette. And then if you think in terms of the compact disc, you had a compact disc player and a compact disc, two different products. Now, all of that is subsumed into a single product, uh, like an iPod, uh, in which uh, uh, both the complementary product and the core product are integrated into one. And so these are ways innovation happens in, in companies. Uh, uh, this is what I mentioned about uh, elimination of ecologically harmful ingredients, completely getting rid of fast food from detergents, et cetera. This also happens a lot, resource use substitution, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to skid up. Uh, the word that is increasingly used now is to what extent can we substitute below ground mining with raw material mined from above ground, which they call it as above ground mining. In other words, recycling of aluminum cans for use in this one, uh, resource use of resource extracted post use or post consumption as referred to as above ground mining. And that is one statistics forms use, often used to say the response. Now, you know, just two weeks ago, I came across this example. And this is a razor, a disposable razor. Uh, what it has done is this, instead of a plastic, now it has comes with a renewable substitution of a non-renewable resource, plastic, with a renewable resource, bamboo, a product part of the company's pledge to be sustainable and so on is, is a brand's effort. Now, the other interesting thing here is Schick's designs raise it appeal to environmentally conscious consumers. What happens sometimes when you do this kind of thing is the cost goes up. And when the cost goes up, consumers' willingness to pay a higher price becomes an issue. And so uh, th this is a lingering problem on our road to sustainability consumers' willingness to pay a higher price for a product that causes less harm to the environment, uh, and, 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 and so on. That becomes an issue, et cetera. So if you combine everything I said, you can all put together into a matrix like this, which identifies as many as 
fortify sustainable innovation opportunities. The same thing also happens in the area of packaging. Uh, also resource use reduction, resource use elimination, and resource use substitution. And here is an innovation uh, uh, which points out that uh, you know, any of us who have used a toothpaste uh, from a tube uh, know are aware of the fact that a little bit of it sticks to the toothpaste tube and doesn't come out. And so now some firms uh, you know, uh, have come up with uh, this kind of a container where uh, nothing is wasted. So it's an innovation that causes less harm to the environment because there is less waste, benefits the firm and benefits consumers and, and uh, this one. So the, with all of this, you might be explained thinking in terms for a moment, uh, what the world really needs are moonshot sustainability innovations, big ambitious, and all I've been talking about like this, or any such thing like this, or you know, trying to solve a problem, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with these kind of things, low-hanging fruits. So the answer is two ways. You know, uh, I, I would like to point out. One is by themselves, sustainable innovations in the vein of low-hanging fruits are likely to have only a modest impact in achieving society's environmental sustainability-related goals. But you also need to keep in mind what could be the second order effect. Organizational learning from pursuit of success with sustainable innovations in the vein of low hanging fruits can play a role in nurturing sustainable innovations culture and climate that is conducive to pursuing moonshot innovations. In other words, like take baby steps and then it equips you to climb a ladder and, and, and so on and so forth. So right now, this is the foremost. Right now, I don't have any supporting evidence, but trying to design a structural study in saying that, you know, do not be dismissive of innovations, sustainable innovations in the vein of low hanging fruits, saying that this isn't going to solve the world's environmental sustainability problem, but think of it as a way of nurturing an organizational culture and climate that is conducive to pursuing moonshot innovations. So uh, as I said, right now, I don't have any empirical evidence. I'm thinking about how to structure the study, where do I collect data and how do I proceed forward, et cetera. Maybe another five years down the road, if I come back, uh, I might have an answer to tell you about this one. So I also want to point out some of the tensions uh, so here is a report, you know, how do we cut 50% granules gas by 2050? So these are all, I'm sure many of you have come across in various, this one, like increase renewable energy, very straightforward. Switch to electric vehicles, often talked about. Close coal-fired power plants. Now think of it moment, if there is an, I talk about co co closing the navy thermal power plant, uh, uh, it, it is not just an environmental solution problem, it's also a political problem and a human problem, et cetera. Control methane from fracking, electrify buildings and appliances, decrease, reduce industrial fumes, et cetera. But let me point to some examples of this one, like switch to electric vehicles, and what are some challenges that are being faced here? So this was an interesting study, which point out that an electric car by automatically doesn't become uh, environmentally sustainable coal, car, the source of electricity powering a plug-in car impacts its environmental footprint. Points out that if you live in Seattle or Portland, Oregon, where about 70% of the electricity comes from renewable sources, such as hydroelectric, if the power for recharging the car comes also from a renewable source, this really has an impact on lowering harm to the natural environment. But on the other hand, if you live in a city like Kansas City, Missouri, where 82% of the electricity comes from coal-fired power plants, owning an electric vehicle doesn't make any difference at all. All you have done is, instead of the pollution coming from 100,000 cars in a city, it comes from 10 chimneys from a coal-fired power plant. So there are these kind of complexities there 
is saying that, in, in other words, making it more local about sustainable innovation, the source of electricity powering a plug-in car impacts that environmental footprint is an electric car charged with electricity from Navely thermal power plant has absolutely no effect on lowering harm to the natural environment. All it does is instead of 1 million cars in Chennai uh, emitting fumes, it goes down to about 25 chimneys at Navely, uh, carbon emissions from there and so on and so forth. So uh, there are these kind of complexities uh, that are there. Now, the other issue that is also complicating is uh, if the roadmap is very clear, uh, uh, in this one, sometimes uh, basically talking about uh, with respect to trucks, 18 wheeler trucks, uh, the truck makers are facing this one is what is the base solution? Should we go electric or with hydrogen? Uh, there are pros and cons with each of these, but saying that for whether it is Benz or Tata's or any of the truck manufacturers, a choice between batteries and fuel, food, hydrogen fuel cells, wagering incorrectly could cost them billions of dollars. Uh, you know, the real right answer is still not clear. And those kind of also challenges come with uh, uh, innovation. So one other area I've been working out uh, for a period of time is I'll wrap up with this one. In, in other words, so one, one dimension of innovation is the supply side. How do we achieve efficiencies with the products we use? That is where talking about resource use reduction, resource use elimination, and resource use substitution. The other is, what are some opportunities for consumption elimination? What are the opportunities for consumption reduction? What are the opportunities for consumption redirection? The a simple example, uh, which for me the inspiration was sometime when I was in India, is in every household I used to see that they used to have a backup power system. Uh, uh, you know, an inverter in case the power goes off, uh, whether for you powering your computer or uh, refrigerator or lights and so on and so forth. Now, the next question becomes, if the flow of electricity was assured from the public utility, nobody would need uh, 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 a backup power system at home. And then you start thinking in terms of fridges having voltage stabilizers uh, because the voltage fluctuates. So if there was no problem with fluctuation in the electricity you get, from the state electricity board, you don't need a product, et cetera. So thinking along the lines of where is an opportunity, if the water that comes out of your tap is safe, then there is no need to buy water in plastic bottles and creating this mess, et cetera. So another way of looking at it is, you know, where are these opportunities for consumption elimination, consumption reduction, and consumption redirection uh, that can be achieved without an adverse impact on the quality of life. In, in, in other words, you would be perfectly comfortable with drinking water and completely do away with plastic bottles if you can be assured that the water that comes out of your tap is 100% safe to drink, right? So it is happening in some areas. Like if you think in terms of what is happening is uh, from incandescent light bulb to LED bulb light bulbs, this is a movement which is happening all over the world. Uh, and uh, some of you may be familiar with, uh, uh, this is the essence of demand redirection from ecologically more harmful to ecologically less harmful substitute products. Like you're familiar with domestic efficiency lighting program by the government of India, where it talks about uh, 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 you know, the potential savings of 400 million rupees annually to consumers with this kind of an initiative, et cetera. And this one. So uh, another way I would put it is innovations for environmental sustainability, a major focus is how do we switch from good for me and bad for me products to good for me and good for me products. So this is an example of what we mean by good for me, bad for me, to good for me and good for me uh, products. 
And so the journey uh, continues in, uh, along those uh, uh, directions. Sometimes I find interesting examples like this and say, you know, this person might not have heard the word sustainability, but uh, was experiencing scarcity of water and started using uh, discarded plastic bottles to drip irrigation. Many of you may be familiar with this company called Jain Irrigation Drip Irrigation System. And here is a person who might not have heard the word sustainability at all, doing what I teach in the classroom, reuse of a resource, plastic bottle, and reduced use of a resource, water. You know, uh, uh, sometimes the, the thing is, it, it happens uh, without people ever having heard the word sustainability. Also, uh, necessity being the mother of invention, innovation, these things happen. And, and, and sometimes I think in terms of uh, at Texas a and University, the kind of money they throw at uh, uh, this kind of things. And here in Indian School of Science, when I was there once, they had a very frugal way of fostering sustainable behaviors uh, using used cardboards for all of this uh, kind of a, a thing. So let me wrap up with uh, saying that, you know, uh, at the same time, there is a lot of what I would call as uh, a moonshot innovations, you know, something which will have really uh, uh, impact, like uh, uh, the phrase that is being used here is called mechanical trees for capturing carbon dioxide from air. Uh, about 100 years ago, the word uh, iron horses was used in reference to automobiles. And along similar lines, the word mechanical trees is being used for machines uh, that pull carbon dioxide from the air and lock it away uh, and, and so on. The whole area of carbon sequestration and innovations which relate to trying to pull uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering them, et cetera. And, and sometimes it is an also an understanding, like even if people are willing to engage in certain behaviors like recycling and so on, you need to make it easy and efficient. And so in uh, uh, Istanbul, they have all of these vending machines uh, where the vending machine itself is designed you know, to absorb, you know, uh, take all of these products and give you a credit which can, you can use for travel. So two few things happening. One is recycling and the other is using mass transit instead of private cars, et cetera. And so these are the kind of win-win solutions, et cetera, which are thought through in this one. And anybody talking to this one about uh, this might happen, uh, uh, no soil, no growing seasons, just add water and technology. And so hydroponics is happening as in sustainable agriculture. And some of you, uh, I, the, you know, I, in India, it's happening with all of the reforestation of deforestation and how something which came out of this one, drones were not developed to address the sustainability problem, but drones are playing a major role these days in planting seeds for reforestation in many parts of the world. And these kind of things happen. Uh, I think I should uh, stop here. Uh, I, I, one other thing, uh, let me wrap in two minutes, uh, saying that uh, uh, with all of these, uh, one other thing that is also happening is uh, uh, promoting what I would call a conspicuous consumption of uh, virtuous products. Uh, uh, like uh, this bag is made from three recycled products. So going to shopping, instead of taking just a bag, taking this, and so this whole area, there's a lot of work happening in the area of promoting conspicuous consumption of virtuous products, worse as well as uh, promoting con non-consumption per se as well, and, and so on. So I'll, I'll stop here because of the interest in time, so that this one, so uh, the closing message uh, on the, uh, this one is Nandrese, uh, uh, Indrese, and, uh, uh, I'll be glad to uh, take a few questions, uh, but again, to use a quote, uh, uh, I may not be able to answer some of your questions. Uh, uh, this is a quote I like, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And, and so I might have to plead ignorance uh, uh, with respect to this. So.
thank you thank you uh, professor vardarajan so you would you like to sort of close this presentation or uh, stop sharing so that uh, we'll have more of your uh, face up on the screen uh, okay i can do that but the only problem is uh, okay i'll, I'll do that uh, uh, yeah unless you want to show something no so my question was in case there was some question for which i need yes, another yeah, yeah you know i have uh, back you know, up another set of questions and i would like to um, uh, actually have it as a form of a conversation for the next 10 minutes 10 15 minutes max max <clears throat> so you can uh, you can stop whenever you want to stop uh, see the the uh, larger issue um, you know let me let me present the problem from a layman's perspective right a comfortable life basically means more energy and the comfort is shown to me by somebody else i don't understand uh, sustainability or uh you know the uh, all the uh, global warming problems etc uh, i see that usage of machines usage of electrical power uh, you know the refrigerator washing machine a comfortable car they all transformed my life personally right mm -hmm. so what role do i have if you come and tell me for example you can say and most environmentalists are saying this i don't mm -hmm. know what they are doing themselves but they mm -hmm. come to me and say hey you know petrol causes problems diesel causes problems don't drive a car uh, you know don't uh, get into copious consumption cut down uh, the power usage so there's a lot of uh, you know gyan that comes out typically and i'm talking mm -hmm. about it from a very 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 lay person right mm -hmm. how are you going to co-opt this lay person into mm -hmm. you know uh, some kind of a sacrifice you are asking him to sacrifice asking him mm -hmm. and her to sacrifice mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so the first mm -hmm. question that poor okay let let me stop at this point and then i will go to the next question afterwards so this is my first uh, uh, point in front of you okay so uh, <clears throat> as i said uh, sometimes in order to answer a question i might have to Uh, uh go to a slide and uh, uh so uh, one way of looking at it and and saying is uh, uh issues relating to environmental sustainability is is not purely uh an environmental science problem it is a social science problem it is a behavioral science problem because it concerns uh the behavior of about uh, 7.5 billion people inhabiting the earth and at the same time there are about 5 billion from whom you cannot ask anything at all because all that emissions are just uh subsistence emissions uh, and uh, uh other than you know uh, that that is there and uh, so all of these theories uh, point really to some of these challenges like uh, the evolutionary biology explanation uh, which looks at and says that the human being is hardwired to uh, respond to immediate threats either run away or fight but the person himself is not hardwired to think about dangers uh the threats that may be there 50 years into the future but that is where leadership plays whether you are talking about corporate leadership in organizations or you think in terms of political leadership uh you know why why do you elect somebody as a prime minister or a president etc uh think about you know uh, these kind of issues uh, you know they say talk about what is the difference between a statesman and a politician a uh, politician does things which are expedient for today whereas a statesman thinks about what is the right thing to do uh with thinking also about future generations in in mind so uh, education is this one and and so one way that is happening is uh, uh you know we we all of us had at some point in our schooling civics uh as a course uh, you know where we were taught a little bit about the constitution and so on and so forth but uh, environmental civics is increasingly being also integrated 
into the school curriculum. In other words, uh, uh, educating children uh, from a very young age uh, is uh, this one. Of course, we also have issues about uh, the percentage of the population which doesn't have the resources even to go to schools, et cetera, kind of thing. But that, that is one way. Now, that is why I said I had this uh, UN report about what is called as the uh, energy trilemma. Uh, so one of the definition of innovation we can talk about is a successful innovation is a product that did not exist yesterday, but few of us can envision living without today, whether it is an air conditioner or a refrigerator or a vehicle, a car, or a personal computer or a smartphone, et cetera. None of these products existed about 25 years ago or 20, 50 years ago, et cetera. Things did not exist yesterday, but few of us can envision living without. And every one of them is consumes energy. So that is where the issue of energy security, in other words, uh, if, if you look at projections worldwide, the demand for energy will go up. And there is energy equity issue. In other words, there are people who are, some of you, there, there is very interesting work which right now uh, the Tata Power is doing along with uh, uh, Rockefeller Foundation on the issue of area of what is called as microgrids. Uh, uh, looking at villages uh, and, and saying that, you know, these are not connected to the grid and uh, uh, it, it is not likely to happen, but uh, experimenting with microgrids, uh, saying that village level grids connecting uh, up with a few streetlight lamps, all, all of them solar powered, and also electricity to the house, and also providing for some very basic things like uh, they, they provide some very interesting, you know, these are all evidence-based research uh, pointing out like uh, a, a lady uh, earning a living uh, with a sewing machine and how much more productivity goes up when the sewing machine goes from a manual to an electric sewing machine because it takes less effort, the quality of life, earnings, etc. go up. And then they give examples about there's another lady who has a sewing machine school. Mm. Uh, and But that operates only from eight to four when there is sunlight and uh, uh, electric power is intermittent. And with this grid, uh, uh, she runs the school as late as nine o'clock and uh, trains more children with sewing and her own lazing, this one, et cetera. So solutions happen, but... Uh, uh, okay. Uh, see, uh, I, I still have uh, a, a big issue with one thing, right? Mm -hmm. One is that when it comes to, you know, uh, in double quotes, destroying the environment, mm -hmm. let's say that, you know, when the car was introduced, its mm -hmm. end result was eventually destroying the environment. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I if I am a neutral person, I go outside the system, mm -hmm. I just study it. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the ecosystem willingly participated in it. Nobody stopped it. The mm. companies produced more cars. The people wanted those cars because they were directly beneficial to them. They were hurting the environment. right? Mm. But the people benefited from it. That is both the, uh, the consumers and the producers, the governments, everybody liked it. Mm -hmm. Only when it came to studying the, uh, uh, the unexpected uh, uh, outcome, uh, namely the massive uh, pollution, uh, you know, you, you looked at the problem much, much later. Now, to undo this, right, you have to threaten people, you have to put a fuel tax, you have to, uh, you have to come up with uh, emission norms, you will have to come up with, uh, you know, car companies, you threaten car companies saying, you know, your uh, emission norms should be like this. You are increasing the cost. So to, to prevent further degradation, mm -hmm. which itself is looking to be very, very difficult because more people want to buy cars, whatever mm -hmm. those cars may be. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you say, hey, you know, I will make available a fantastic uh, public transportation system, etc. You still have people wanting uh, mm -hmm. that freedom to move around. So the, 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 the process of arresting 
the environmental degradation this is only an example you can take any other case it's, it's right, right. similar mm-hmm. only is by way of massive threats to the system making people very angry about it right so if you take you know in the us how the republicans view this how the free marketers view this how the uh, uh, you know people with unfettered uh, you know people who want uh, uh, you know total uh, uh, you know uh, freedom how they look at it versus the uh, the people who are uh, who are willing to be controlled uh, you know higher taxation higher restriction uh, etc how they view it as democrats right the process is it becomes highly political in a kind of, a kind of an indian uh, system here yeah, it's not very clear i mean the what the political parties themselves think about this everybody seems to talk about environmentalism but i don't know whether they even have a clue about it actually so in this kind of a scenario if i go and tell somebody let's say let, 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 let me propose something right every day i mean this has also been proposed by people at different times like in, including from lal bahadur shastri right mm-hmm. uh, when the food was uh, mm-hmm. sort of uh, short so if i say we can save environment a lot mm-hmm. if we uh, cut down on electricity by not using it from 5 to 6 pm every day you know voluntarily we think people will even agree to that now if i even make that statement i will be beaten up on the streets right mm-hmm. so how are we going to convince a large number of people mm-hmm. to sacrifice which is a challenge in front of governments policy makers professors uh, and so on right some way you have to sacrifice if you want to reduce uh, uh, you know all these bad things to the environment is there an alternative at all so two things one is uh, you know uh, before i answer uh, i don't want to come across as uh, uh, a preacher okay when it comes to uh, environmental sustainability i would uh, qualify myself as a researcher and a teacher and not a preacher okay mm-hmm. so with, there is a reason i'm i'm trying to tell you so i'm going to use a couple of quotes to get across this message about uh, uh, this is about uh, uh as uh, you know your questions are very important we'll take a minute but i want to use these two slides to get across this message uh, like dalai lama once you know i came across this one i thought a scientist from chile once told me it is inappropriate for a scientist to be attached to his particular field of study since that would undermine his objectivity so it's a very difficult thing for me and i'm passionate about this area but at the same time i've also got to be objective and 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 detached the essence of scientific inquiry is dispassionate pursuit of truth uh, let the chips fall where they may or in tamil patra tran patra may be the nearest i can think of as this one and let me use one more this one this is the same thing also uh, uh, karl marx uh, uh, sorry not karl marx uh, wrote about as saying that social scientists must try to keep personal values out of the scholarship uh, and 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 so uh, the thing is you know you started with automobiles the point there is it is in many ways a civilization transforming innovation uh, you know how we live has been radically transformed by innovations in transportation uh, uh, whether it is uh, the trains or the planes or the automobiles or the buses okay society cannot function without them so nobody is talking about uh, this one uh, and it is a major driver of engine of economic growth uh, if you think in terms of transportation of goods uh, uh, whether you need ships trucks vehicles and and so on and so forth and so uh, the thing is there is a famous quote by a guy called commoner in saying that we are looking for solutions uh, uh, it's the equivalent of having the cake and eating it too so that is in a way the environmental sustainability uh, uh, challenge so uh, i i violated this uh, uh, these two quotes uh, 
Uh, in one, I, 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 you know, I, I, one day I was looking at uh, something and uh, many of us are familiar with uh, the oath physician's take, which is called as Hippocratic Oath, uh, uh, as uh, first do no harm, is a promise by physicians to act morally in their roles. Uh, uh, the environmental oath, I thought, equivalently is do no harm. Uh, when causing harm to the environment is unavoidable, choose a path that causes minimal harm to the environment. And so then I elaborate that on that as citizens, consumers, environmental oath, uh, corporate decision makers, environmental oath, and country leaders, environmental oath. Let me just give you one example and say this one. In other words, you know, at least the educated, the edge enlightened part of the world, uh, uh, you know, the 2.5 billion have got to move in this direction do no harm to the natural environment whenever and wherever possible. Choose ecologically less harmful substitute products to meet specific needs and wants whenever and wherever possible. Do minimal harm to the natural environment during the search for purchase and use of disposal of products to meet specific needs and wants. So this is the preacher, not the researcher or the teacher, but the preacher part of me. Uh, I, I have some of these things. Uh, and likewise, you know, if you, if you look at something, company like Tata's or Mahindra, you look at the CEOs and the way, you know, I, I often listen and uh, listening to uh, Anand Mahindra and, uh, you know, the company itself seems to be acting along these lines. In other words, uh, you know, if you're making vehicles, you're going to uh, cross onto this one. But uh, this is the way some companies at least seem to be working, uh, like choose courses of action that would cause minimal harm to the environment whenever and wherever possible. So uh, it is zero harm is, uh, uh, you know, although they talk about net zero, et cetera, it is far into the future. And so this is the best that's going to happen. Uh, there are a couple of questions from uh, our uh, viewers. There's mm -hmm. one uh, from Priya Subramanian, where she says, Wide use of glass for windows has increased the heat and the necessity for air conditioning in homes and offices. Mm -hmm. uh, I can stretch that further. I mean, I will come to her question shortly. Uh, you know, you're also uh, sort of closing our rooms. There is no cross ventilation. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, for uh, totally different reasons, like you don't want dust to come in, you don't want uh, pollution to come in. But the fact is that if you do that, you need air conditioning. Uh, apart from the sun control film, her question is this, are there heat resistant glasses to save energy? Uh, uh, you know, speak it not on subjects matters, I don't know. But, uh, you know, in the field of architecture, there is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of work, uh, whether you look at it from the standpoint of construction, science, engineering, science, etc., as well as architecture, uh, you know, energy efficient buildings, uh, whether it is households or commercial establishments is a major focus of innovation. And I don't know details about what is happening, but all I know is occasionally once uh, I come across articles uh, saying that, well, uh, when you have an enclosed structure uh, to keep dust and uh, uh, other harmful particles away, uh, you need air conditioning, but Efficiencies in air conditioning is one way that is happening. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I wish there, there's a Wall Street Journal article recently which talks about some work that's happening in this area. So the answer is uh, innovation everywhere uh, in various fields. But, but do they all? I mean, I, know I, I, have, I have more questions, but I will, I will uh, jump to another question and then come back to this. Mm -hmm. This question from Ramanujam Dragavan. He wants to know what is the impact of pandemic on mm -hmm. um, most transportation related sustainability innovation? Mm -hmm. So, so I had a slide on that. Let me quickly see if I can go into that one. Uh, 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 you know, I need to be more efficient. So this is not going to work. So the, the point is uh, sometimes uh, when uh, things completely go into uh, uh, this one. Uh, <clears throat> if you think in terms of the amount of waste that the pandemic has caused uh, 
in, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in hospitals, uh, uh, particularly when you see in China, in Shanghai and Beijing, when they show television shots of uh, uh, the people in mass and so on and so forth, and after a single use, throwing it away, etc. Uh, the number they report is uh, the use of resources to ward off the pandemic would be the equivalent of putting the world behind in its path towards sustainability by three or four years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, I, I like But what about the flip side? For three months, we had the entire world transportation infrastructure except emergencies right. shut down, right? Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. no carbon pollution from billions of cars, planes, trains. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. So, so that was the, that, that. I think that article was more like talking about the net effect, or, right. or, or essentially it was talking about the amount of plastic waste that has gone into oceans as a result of uh, the pandemic. Uh, this one. Okay. Uh, see the uh, uh, you know even even if you take for example the uh, you know uh, what has happened during pandemic right now people didn't travel much for a variety of reasons but goods had to be transported to them the you know you you are a professor of e-commerce you would have seen uh, how much of uh, business uh, that went to right, e-commerce right. companies and particularly mm -hmm. amazon Mm -hmm. And even in India, that uh, that happened, where uh, once people are so comfortable with mm -hmm. ordering things from the comfort of home, mm -hmm. and we are in a sense sort of also promoting it, mm -hmm. the amount of packaging material required. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I really want to uh, yeah, look yeah, at the yeah, Americans yeah. and offer them the following, right? You guys are talking about sustainability. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't you go to the nearby uh, uh, grocer who will use, uh, who will make use of the use the uh, newspaper and mm -hmm. he will give you your grains uh, wrapped in that. Would mm -hmm. people in US be comfortable with, you know, moving to that kind of a thing at all? I mean, if you say, oh, it's a, it's a fantastic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, living with the uh, environment kind of a thing where, uh, you know, uh, you carry your uh, uh, cloth bags and uh, fill up uh, all the newspaper bundled uh, groceries and then bring it home. Would, uh, would people even be ready for something like that when it is even pitched to them? So uh, I, I would not directly answer your question, but uh, uh, the, there are some very interesting articles on what is called as the unintended consequences mm -hmm. of good intentions. So what happens these days is when you go to conferences, uh, most of the time, at conferences, they give you one of those reusable bags. Mm. And very soon, you end up with 20 reusable bags. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Likewise, when you go to conferences, uh, they start giving uh, these reusable bottles. You can de decline them saying that, no, I already have one. I don't need a second one, etc. <laughs> but very, very, very soon, uh, this one. And I teach in the class, and at the end of the class, I would see sometimes students, uh, about at least four or five students, uh, forgetting the uh, reusable water bottle in the classroom and walking away to this one. So they're going to spend another $15 uh, uh, replacing that. Hmm. And if you start thinking in terms of the amount of steel and other material that goes into reusable bottles, uh, what is the environmental impact of each time a kid, a school, a college student, forgetting uh, a reusable bottle in the classroom and buying another one, etc.? So the mathematics of ecology is very you know, complex. And uh... okay, uh, so the, there is one uh, final point from me is that you talked about you you gave two examples, one Colgate coming mm -hmm. up with the innovation of uh, replaceable uh, brush heads. Mm -hmm. Second, a razor company uh, mm -hmm. using uh, uh, bamboo. material mm -hmm. like bamboo uh, mm -hmm. for uh, the holder. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but fundamentally, these were the companies that mm -hmm. promoted themselves 
by increasing the consumption you know if you look at their uh, their uh, advertisement they'll mm-hmm. always have uh, you know paste filling that entire one end to the other end mm-hmm. but in reality uh, those of us who keep regularly brushing our teeth know mm-hmm. that you know it is enough to have just a small uh, mm-hmm. portion of it is good enough to provide a good clean uh, feel mm-hmm. why don't they first talk about such things that that will hit them at the profit right so they will not they will not be uh, willing to talk about that even now when they are mm-hmm. talking about all these replaceable head etc mm-hmm. are they going to change the pricing it is just that overall from the profitability aspect from the turnover and the profits nothing will change it is just that the amount of garbage that is created may change so mm-hmm. there may be good uh, uh, you know intentions on that part mm-hmm. but it doesn't change uh you know the material that uh, the, the the profitability in fact the profitability may even go up because mm-hmm. the pack of uh, the replaceable heads would still be sold at the same end user price mm-hmm. compared to the entire uh, you know the total brush uh, stuff and only they or some of the top companies would be able to uh, uh, you know even pitch and market something like that and immediately you know all the second rung third rung fourth rung uh, brush makers Mm-hmm. uh will be at a huge disadvantage to them right so i you know i i, 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 I so, so, let, let me make a few observations right one is how the invisible hand plays how economic forces interact with each other uh it, it's uh, it's 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 a very uh, sophisticated you know complex issue and uh, we cannot answer now two things happen one is when it comes to a firm uh, uh you know i had a few slides in the interest of time i didn't use I, you know you can think in terms of what is the government's sustainability responsibility and then you think in terms of what is corporate sustainability responsibility what is the response sustainability response related responsibility of individual corporations and then citizens consumer responsibility sustainability response what is responsibility of you and me as a citizen now let me first think in terms of first talk about corporate sustainability responsibility then what happens is it is a concurrent pursuit of a larger economic footprint and market footprint and a smaller environmental footprint meaning that the company has to grow has to create wealth for shareholders and at the same time has to lower the impact of its activities on the environment and likewise if you think in terms of government you start thinking in terms of what is happening in uh, this one each year each month more than a million people enter a job market in india and so you need to create work let me give you i think i might have an example to answer your question here i should uh, butter uh, okay so this is california Uh, if california were to be a separate country uh, they say it would be the fifth largest economy or sixth largest economy now if you start asking the question what is a government's response state or sustainability responsibility whether it is at the national country level or at the state level or city level etc and here what is happening is it is policies programs laws regulations conducive to a larger economic footprint the economy has got to grow and a smaller environmental footprint and so here it shows in california some trend lines from 2000 to 2015 the gdp is growing okay this is a larger economic footprint the population is growing but then you start looking at some other things like what is the total greenhouse gas emissions it is coming down so this is the essence of a larger economic footprint and a smaller environmental footprint we need to achieve both and some countries have shown that this is possible a good example then you look at what happens is how do you get lower the greenhouse gas emissions it is through greenhouse gas emissions per gdp for every dollar of gross domestic product if the intensity of energy intensity is brought down the amount of resources you use is brought down etc even when this grows per per gdp it comes down the population is growing here but greenhouse gas emissions per capita per person is coming down 
because of incentives for installing solar roofs on their households and putting uh, you know taxes on luxury vehicles etc and mandating minimum fuel efficiency standards etc for vehicles etc so this is what ha is happening and at least in one place and it it is this one so this is what you look at as copper at the government level in 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 other words if at least 15 million people enter the job market in india every year jobs have to be created once somebody gets a job they are going to have their own apartment have their own vehicle etc and so this is all going up but this is what needs to be done and so this is where the challenge rides and so then you start thinking in terms of what happens in a company level like uh, you know this is unilever saying that their emphasis is getting a larger market footprint growing but at the same time a smaller environmental footprint and saying how are we going to do both saying that one is uh, we are going to increase our customer base by 1 billion dollars this was around 2010 unilever telling that uh, it's using the word improving health and well being of more than 1 billion this one but it is selling soap shampoos detergent coffee tea to 1 billion people who are not consuming any of these things uh, uh, you know well, this one etc but at the same time saying that uh, this is what we are going to do is by 2030 our goal is to have the environmental footprint of making use of our products as we grow our business this is larger market footprint as we grow our business have the economic environment footprint this is smaller environment by doing what reducing greenhouse uses water use waste and packaging sustainable sourcing etc and so this is uh, what is the challenge companies are faced with and are handling and this is the challenge countries are faced with and are handling okay uh I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of. Uh, no, I, I understand, but uh, but to but to change things around across, uh, I can see that you know uh, certainly you know I uh, uh, you know the California information looks interesting, uh, but the big change will be when when few countries are demonstrating that their GDP is going up or at least staying where it is with marginal increase. but their uh, emissions are coming down drastically and the quality of life is not suffering then they become a model for uh, the developing countries to say hey you know we need to increase our consumption now because so many people have not yet come to uh, uh, that you know energy equity part of it but it is possible for us to sort of reach uh, uh, you know our uh, max and then we can either stay there or may even come down as new technology emerges so that's uh, that's an uh, interesting uh, kind of an idea so uh, gopu you have any other questions i think uh, i've pretty much asked everything yeah i think we are i i ask a rhetorical question i i i lost the dev play the devil's advocate uh i uh, so my this thing is the first, very first slide he mentioned uh skepticism is the basics you know is the spirit of science and it's very hard to you know take anyone take people seriously when you have uh, you know uh, you have an environmental conference where all the leaders fly in on private planes into europe and then they tell us your scooters are polluting uh, it's simply not you you have to see what you, you know what the reality is you see political hypocrisy mm -hmm. or corporate hypocrisy or mm -hmm. media hypocrisy mm -hmm. and then uh, expect you know other people to behave people ask people to behave in a different way than you are mm -hmm. do as i say not as i do mm -hmm. it's not going simply not going to happen uh, mm -hmm. you can you can say what you want but it won't to happen mm -hmm. so what do you what, what do you say to that i know this denial mm -hmm. is a very popular uh, i uh, think so that that's actually part of the thing denial so, or skepticism is uh... so so uh, a, a, a few things one is uh, you know everything uh, you you say is uh, uh, 
uh, how do you build credibility in a message when your behavior is an antithesis of how the rest of the world should live? Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. But the point I'm trying, what I would like to point out is uh, the university is, is more of what I would call as a secluded environment. And, 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 and so, you know, I, I like this quote uh, uh, very much. Uh, there is this uh, professor, Catherine Eheo, she's a climate scientist. And, and so she goes and gives a lot of talks in churches, etc. And she often gets this response, people saying, I, I, I think climate change, global warming is all a hoax. I do not believe it. And, and so her response is, science is about facts. It's not about beliefs. Science is not impacted by statements such as, I do not believe in global warming. And she gives this as an example, that, uh, you know, accidentally I found out. The consequences, I do not believe in gravity. And taking a step forward from the cliff of a mountain affects that person. However, the consequences of the leader of a nation saying, I do not believe in global warming and taking no actions in the face of mounting scientific evidence places in peril all of humanity. Okay. So uh, leadership matters. Uh, if you say lead, lack of leadership is a problem, and uh, there's truth to that. And that is also a question very worthy of investigation. And you may say, you don't have to investigate. Uh, you know, it is so blurringly evident where is the need to even formally investigate it as a research question. It is self-evident from observation. Yeah, I agree. So that, 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 that's why, I, I, you know, for, for me, as I said, uh, my own journey has been nibbling at the edges of an inherently complex problem. Uh, for me, the journey has been personally satisfying. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it uh, intellectually energizes me. And at the end of the day, it makes me feel satisfied uh, with what I'm doing. Uh, but I make no claims that whatever I'm doing is going to solve the world's problems. But, uh, you know, who knows, some student in my class, uh, might someday become a senator or a governor. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is like the chaos theory, uh, like some uh, butterfly, uh, a small thing happening and having an impact somewhere in a big scale. So that is what all I hope for. In other words, uh, uh, you know, uh, somewhere, uh, I don't have the leadership abilities. Uh, uh, I can only write and talk, uh, but uh, uh, so... It's another way I look at philosophically these things. Yeah. This is a, there is a good example is a, uh, if if you need uh, there is some very interesting articles on what are wicked problems. Mm. Uh, wow. You know these are not these are not well structured problems. These are highly ill structured problems. They call as wicked problems. One is uh, lack of consensus on even the question of what is the problem you are trying to solve. And then what is the solution? Are you sure if we do this, the problem will be solved? So uh, if you have ambiguity about what is a problem, uh, there is, cannot be a solution. And so that is the essence of a wicked problem. Right? Okay. Uh, I think that's pretty much it, uh, Gopu. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Vadrajan for... Uh, for a thought-provoking uh, session, I, you know, I have a lot of questions. I see uh, from where I am sitting, uh, the need for uh, uh, growth, but the challenge that environment uh, faces, and we really have to understand how we can reconcile the two and uh, come to some kind of a working solution at a country level, at a, uh, at a global level, uh, you know, with, with equity as the right uh, word to uh, go by. And that's going to be a challenge. And uh, we, let's see how, how in the coming uh, uh, years, decades, the, uh, the world governments react to that and how we, in our own small way, contribute a little bit towards that. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again. Hope you want to make any announcement about next week, uh, next month's talk or your uh, 
the programs uh, that you are launching uh, no just the uh, just a reminder that the astronomy camp summer camp will happen you know in may for students we have put the event up on our facebook page uh, twitter and all that next month events will notify when uh, you know we finalize and uh, the next month monthly lecture will finalize and uh, let you know on our website and all that uh, the astronomy course will happen in for students will you know start in on may 11th it's a five day program uh, two hours each day and those if those that that information is out there okay. so thank you we'll, we'll go on our website shortly so thank you and uh, bye bye everyone uh, from our side well thank you all again thank for the all. opportunity i want to take this opportunity thank you and uh, uh, gopu uh, uh, i'm sure you're familiar today when you talk about astronomy the alignment of the Gen uh, venus and jupiter is it tonight uh, is, are you going to be able to watch that or something that's at early morning here so i have to wake up before like midnight or uh, say wake up at five o'clock or something so i i, I saw that in uh, local uh, it showed as uh, 3.30 a.m. Central Time, you, sorry, Eastern Time, and I thought of you when I saw a news item about that. Yeah. I saw it last year when it was in the night, so it's a no, no strain at all. So, okay. so well, Thank you all for... Yeah.